Tonight, we continue the discussion on how to have a successful day, a meaningful day, a day with drive, a day with purpose, a day when you accomplish. And we have so many different ideas. Grab as many as you would like to have that incredible day. So last week, we began discussing different ideas, strategies, things we are familiar with, things maybe we haven't put into practice. have a better day. As we called it, how to have a more successful day. We discuss what does it mean success? How does Torah, how do we see in Judaism, the term successful being used and what that means in our life. That's the goal to continue today discussing different tips, strategies, tools we can implement from Judaism to have a better day, have a successful day. There's a lot of different ideas that apply in different situations throughout the day. One thing that is really wonderful to remember when we want to amp up the energy of the day is we have this amazing gift called Torah. Torah is is the most precious thing there is. God invested himself in Torah. God sharing with us himself. God sharing with us his diary, his self, his being. So when we need it, when we want it, when we need more positivity in our day, nowadays you, you can go on your phone and get Torah. You could go on your laptop and get Torah. There's so many ways to access another class, more study, and it's really the most precious thing in the world and a real way to bring God and God's blessings into your day. Something else that, of course, we've discussed many times to remember is there's only one God, right? That's the most foundational statement of Judaism. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. We're supposed to start the class with that blessing. We somehow keep forgetting, but there's only one God. There's no other power, which means I'm very safe. I'm secure. All is him. He is good. He is my father. I'm his only child. So these are ideas we've discussed and discussed and discussed in so many different ways over the many years of this class. But of course, we're never done working on these ideas because they're so counterintuitive. Because we look and we see a world and we look and we get nervous and we look and we get stressed and we look and we get scared and we look and we freak out or have a panic attack. And no, Shema Yisrael, all God. There's only God. It's all God. There's only God. There's nothing but God. That is the most calming thought I know. It's the most significant thought I know. There's only God. It's all God. Nothing is happening except exactly, precisely as God wills. So why does it not look so great when there's only God and God loves me so much? Does he love me? Absolutely. What's going on? And maybe he wants us to work more. (laughs) Maybe he sees the growth that we can achieve, must achieve, need to achieve. But even when we're doing hard stuff, going through that growth, working in the trenches because he sees all what I could be and he wants me to become it. When I'm aware, but it's all him, I could be working, working, but with tranquility. Shema Yisrael, there's only God. Another idea that we discussed at a certain point in this class was quite a number of years ago where we discussed this so extensively, like every week we came back to it. It's such a powerful, practical concept. It was the idea of leaving our Egypt. Leaving our Egypt in Hebrew etymologically means leaving our limitations. Do you remember? Someone here remembers when we discussed that week after week? You could just put a thumbs up on your thing. Do you remember? Who remembers who was in the class then? I remember some of you in the class then. Remember discussing that? Rachel's nodding. Yes, she remembers. Week after week, we kept focusing on this very powerful idea. We can leave our limitations. And every day, we're defining this as a successful day. What's part of a successful day? To leave a limitation. To leave part of a limitation. Take one foot, one toe, one finger out of a limitation every single day. We want a successful day. We want a powerful day. We want a positive day. We want a day when we get out of something that's been limiting us. Would anyone like to share a limitation that they have left or a limitation they would like to leave? Anyone want to share something they've left or something they would like to leave? I know this is definitely something we've discussed and worked on a lot. Um, I worked a while ago on um, like I have a thought about something. Um, I'm very worried about the negative situations that will progress into more negative situation. So I would just go, I would think about it, and the road would take me straight into negative, more negative, and more negative. I already knew, knew, knew. And then um, 
um, with your classes, I trained myself. The second I, I thought, I created another road, and it made it all positive. Wow. And, and, and I'm used Great to it. Egypt to leave. Wow. That is amazing, Rifka. I thought about the situation. Boom. This road was blocked. And I would, I created new, uh, new one. Positive. And, and after a while, I mean, a, a lot of times it works. It's not that it's uh, all 100%. But, but I, I like that uh, lesson. And then I took it. Wow, that's amazing. That's very, very powerful Egypt to leave because I'm sure we can all relate to that one. Anyone else has an Egypt they've left or they would like to leave? They're planning on leaving? They're attempting to leave? Hi. Hi, Chava. Got you back with some sunshine on your face. Thank you. Yes, I'm back. I think... I don't know if I completely left, but definitely improved in my Egypt that I felt that I am in control, that I uh, am responsible for everything what's going to happen. And uh, I I would say that I made a huge breakthrough, uh, remembering that it is Hashem's world and um, uh, I need to trust Hashem. And a lot of times it works. I remember that uh, when I get worried or something, I'm just uh, Hashem. I'll talk to Hashem and ask him to help me to resolve the situation, to find a way. And uh, it's like a huge removing burden for my shoulders it's like it's really like removing Egypt that is a huge Egypt to leave I don't want anyone to get intimidated because Rivka spoke of a huge Egypt that we can all relate to and Chava is talking about a huge Egypt that we can all relate to that could be sound like so amazing and unbelievable that everybody would be like oh forget it <laughs> obviously it took many many days again a little bit and then again a little bit and then again a little bit and bit by bit you're just breaking through more until that's natural. And then there's a next level that's natural. And then there's a next level that's natural. And then you get to the point where Hava is saying, yeah, I think I could say I left that Egypt. That's a huge one to leave. That's a very powerful, very transformative. And it makes your life much happier. Just as Rifka's Egypt made her life much happier. When we leave Egypt, we are benefiting. God wants us to leave Egypt. We want to leave Egypt. Anyone else have an Egypt they left? Rachel? The ongoing process, of course. But I see. I think I've made a lot of progress in uh, thinking nicer about people, not not judging. I catch myself right away. <laughs> and I wow. just... That's also very big because that's mm-hmm. a very inner piece. How we look at people, we so fast. The courtrooms of our mind are like, and like to train ourselves to say, stop. Like Rifka said, stop, roadblock, stop, positive or nothing. Either positive thought or just move on. Think about the dishes I have to wash. Think about God. Think about something else. And I learned that it's possible to find good things in everybody and think positively, being um, empathetic. And everybody has uh, his own situation. And I try to remind myself that, you know, it's famous. I don't know who said that. But if this person was in my place, probably did better than I. And if I was in his place, maybe I wouldn't do so better. That, so there's two, there's two ideas. You're, I don't know which one you're referring to. There's two ideas ideas you could be referring to. One is actually how the sages explain, and this relates to this week's Torah portion, actually, the enormous humility of Moshe Rabbeinu of Moses. Because the Torah state that Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. And the question is, really? How is that possible? He, he doesn't know what he's accomplishing and accomplished and did. I mean, he's the ultimate leader of the Jewish people, head and shoulders, literally and figuratively above everyone else and got us out of Egypt and the 10 plagues and the splitting of the sea and 120 days in heaven and 40 years in the desert. I mean, come on, brought down the Torah. What's going on? What's he thinking? Is he delusional? Our sages said, no, what he was thinking was everything I have is because of God's gift, because of the powers God gave. And it's possible these gifts, they would be doing what I'm doing and they would actually be doing even more. Even better. I do not know why my screen is completely black. That was weird. Now you're back. But that's what Moses said. Maybe I was saying something so powerful. Like, whoa, shocked my computer for a second. That's a deep one to internalize. That's another big Egypt to leave. The Egypt of ego. And that that road of saying someone else. Almost combining two ideas. That idea. Oh, and... The idea of judgment is that we're told, our sages say, don't judge a person until you're in their place. In Hebrew, don't judge a person until you're in his place. Why? Because his place is causing him to sin. 
his place is causing him to fall. And in Tanya, the altar of discussed is that this place means both the physical place and the spiritual place. And when you look at someone else, you have no clue their place. You don't know what type of family they grew up with, how functional, dysfunctional, supportive, or troubled. Was he a street corner person or not? What's his current place? What's his home-like life? What's his work environment like? There's all these places that you don't know and you don't know what you'd be like if you were in those places. And there's his spiritual place. There's the strength of the evil inside of him. That's also his place. You don't know, the Alter Rebbe says, does he have a regular oven inside of him or perhaps a commercial oven? Those fires are a lot more intense. You don't know. Well, until you're in his place, you can't judge him. And we have no clue his place. And we have no clue how we would be if we were in those places, spiritually or physically. I don't know which of the two or a combination you were alluding to, because both of them are very relevant. And you sort of were touching on both ideas. But you're absolutely right. When we think of this, we can really be very compassionate. And compassion is a great tool to mitigate judgment and it's a really good deep deep egypt to leave so when we're doing this work when we're saying every single day i want to leave my egypt now rifka and chava and rachel all happen to speak about really big deep egypt and when that's the egypt you're leaving you can be leaving that same egypt for many days as long as you're focused it's an accomplished, successful day because there were probably multiple opportunities to slip back into slavery, to slip back into limitation, into imprisonment. And you're like, no, I'm walking out. I'm free. And it could take many, many, many days until you really say, you know, that Egypt I'm done with. I've got myriads of others I could look at. But that one, I think, I think I'm asked. And then you look at something else. So a successful day positive day, a day when we really feel we achieved, because when we feel we achieved, that's a good day when we can look back and say, yes, of course, I'm tired. Of course, I'm exhausted. I mean, that's life. But I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and I achieved. That's a successful day. That's a special day. Something else that helps us have this good day, and this touches on what Rachel was just saying, is recognizing how special every person is around you. Every Jew, viewing every Jew as special, every Jew is special. And of course, as Rachel said, sometimes that's a challenge. And sometimes we have to push ourselves to come up with it, to, to, to believe it, to focus on it. And maybe, you know, going back to what Rifka was saying about the negative roads in our brain, maybe it's easier to see the negative that's more overt. And maybe that's a more natural go-to we sometimes have. But when we're looking around us and seeing the negative in people, it doesn't create a very successful day. It creates sort of like a very in your box looking at everyone and feel. No, that's not the energy of a successful day. When you can look around and see the beauty in the world, the beauty in flowers, the beauty in the sky, and most significantly, the beauty in the people in your world, that's the backdrop for a good day, for a positive day, for a successful day. Now, of course, sometimes some people naturally look at people and just see that, and some people are surrounded by people where it's really easy. And then there's the rest of us. And for the rest of us, it could be a lot of work. But like Rachel saying about leaving that Egypt, you leave it step by step, time after time after time, don't worry, God will send you many practice sessions, many opportunities, and you just keep getting stronger and stronger and more and more comfortable. Then when you look at someone, you process, see, note, celebrate their good. And then when this amazing thing happens, and they, they actually sort of start shifting. And that's a very cool thing to see like this person I always thought was whatever, whatever, whatever. And then as I'm looking at them and seeing their beauty and being happy in their beauty, they really, that's somehow changing. It's, it's almost eerie, the power we have. And I'm not going to say it happens overnight, but we can see it happen. Has anyone experienced that? That they've really changed how they look at someone? And... They really saw that person change. Anyone? Yes. Can I ask? 
And it's like, again, a fine balance. You mentioned at the end of the last class that there are some people that you want to avoid. What do you think about that? How you handle this kind of situations? Some people do something that is not pleasant for you or whatever. How you deal with that? You have to admit that it exists, right? Absolutely. Not everybody is nice to us. 100%. And I think it really is exactly as you said. It's a balance of... On one hand, what Ruffle's asking is the last point, actually, we discussed last week. So Ruffle gets like full stars on her chart because she remembered last week. She remembered the last point the last week. So we were saying that sometimes when we're working to have a good, happy, successful, positive, achieving, accomplishing day, there's all this like toxic energy around and how we have to protect ourselves from that so we don't get sucked into it. And now I'm saying look at everyone positively. Every Jew is so special. Every Jew is so good. And the more you see them as good, the more they will live up to your sight of them. So which do I believe? I believe both. I really believe both. How do you balance both? It's sort of like there's a verse that says the right hand draws close and the left hand pushes away. So you're drawing close, you're pushing away. You're doing both. It depends sometimes on the situation, sometimes on your energy level, sometimes on the person, and sometimes on doing absolutely the both at the same time. Like in in educating children to be absolutely firm and absolutely loving. Well, which one are you going to be, firm or loving? No, you're going to be both. The child needs absolute strong, firm, clear lines and absolute love and respect and attention and warmth. And well, if you're more naturally once, you have a card to do the other one as well, but the child needs both. So I think similarly, if there's someone in your world who creates a lot of negative energy, and if you absorb that negative energy, it's going to stifle you. It's going to pollute your energy. It's going to pull you down. You're all positive and excited, and you actually came to this class, and you can't wait to put all this into practice. You're already envisioning all the Egypts you're going to leave, and this is so exciting. And then some person gives you like a whole bucket of cold water, you know, you need to create barriers. You need to build protection around yourself. You need to create your fortresses that protect you from that energy. And at the same time, you want to look at that person and see their good. And you want to recognize that good. And you want to focus on that good. And you want to have those barriers firmly in place. You want to have the barriers because at this moment, they're still emitting a lot of pollutants. But at the same time, there's good in them. People are complex. Very rarely is someone completely black. Very rarely is someone completely white. Of course, some people, this color dominates and some people, this color dominates. But everyone's a combination. It's actually, there's an interesting law in terms of a mitsura, someone that potentially has this spiritual illness, which is reflected in a physical skin disease called saras. We call a leper, leprosy, but we don't mean it as a physical illness. It was really a spiritual manifestation that came out in these physical spots on the person's body. And since it was a spiritual illness, the only one that could proclaim this person spiritually ill was the priest, no doctors. This is a spiritual issue, the priest. The person himself was the greatest scholar of the, of the generation. He couldn't look at himself and say he had saras. No, nope, only the priest. So the law is that if a priest comes to someone and he looks at his skin and all he sees is saras, every inch he looks at, he sees is covered with this spiritual skin disease, he doesn't proclaim him impure. He knows his eyes have a problem. Because no Jew can we look at and say, everywhere I look, I only see bad. That's impossible. And if you see that, your eyes have a problem. So the priest is supposed to go away. And when he comes back, if he finds some clear flesh, then he can can proclaim the person impure. But if all he sees is impurity, he knows his eyes are at fault. So that's literally a law. It's a law. But it reflects a very deep spiritual truth. So maybe it's simpler to just be one and not the other. Like it's simpler to just love your children and give to them and nurture them. Or it's simpler to have very firm rules and balances. Of course it's simpler, but it's not better. 
So also with us, when we're interacting with people, it's simpler to look at everyone with the right eye and see they're good and see they're good. It's simpler to have very firm walls up. But actually, we need both. We need to have those walls of protection, not to get pulled down by anyone's negative energy. And at the same time, those people have good. Every Jew has to look at them. And sometimes you have to work hard to find the good. And sometimes you don't have to work so hard to find the good. As I said, people are complex. People have many things going on. But that, yeah, I know the good, but no. Look at the good. Celebrate the good. See them through the good. It's not easy. If they're driving you crazy, harming you, being dangerous, being destructive, it's not easy. But that doesn't take away the responsibility to look for the good, to see the good, to celebrate the good. The more we focus on the good, the more we pull out the good in them. But at the same time, we have protection because there's also other parts of them. But we can understand that when we look at the world around us and really strengthen the good in the world by seeing the good in people, how this totally enhances our world, our day, our life. So I go back to my question, has anyone experienced this, that as they shifted in how they looked at someone, they actually, maybe they didn't connect it, but somehow the person started to shift as well. Very powerful because it actually actually happens we really can do it not fast not easy but very significant very significant something else what we're really trying to build that day is to truly look at yourself and understand that you can have a real relationship with god you can truly and must truly love god and fear god and be nullified to god and sometimes we 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 hear these things and we think that's for the books. <laughs> that's for some holy people that lived probably a long time ago, probably not on this continent. You know, some other people in some other reality, they loved God, they feared God. But it really creates success, changes your life. It really does. Because the more you really have this relationship, the more God is so real in your world, and the more you have that confidence, you have that strength of knowing he's right with you. Like Again, the more you love, the more you fear, the more you know he is with you. You are not alone. I can't think of anything that more afflicts people in our world than this sense of loneliness but as we really really develop that relationship with god that love of god and fear of god and awareness of god it gives us so much strength it makes us so much more confident in ourselves because it's self with all of god who's helping us has anyone seen this in themselves that as god became more real they saw a shift in how they looked at the world and how they looked at their challenges in their perception of their own strengths. Anyone saw that change as God became more real, as their relationship with God became more real? They just sort of, maybe without connecting the two, saw they changed in how they lived. Now, I definitely feel that very strongly because I can definitely say for myself that as I started learning Hasidic thought, as we learned at one point, Tanya, and of course, Many times we bring in things with Hasidic thought, as, which means as God became more and more real, definitely I felt and feel his strength. Definitely feel that sense of not alone, empowered, supported. And when you're coming with that base, you approach life and approach your challenges with confidence instead of with fear, with security instead of with intimidation. And that creates a very different outcome. Along those same lines, but in a slightly different way, is understanding and thinking. These are all different thoughts, different things to focus on. How in the world are you supposed to remember all of them? Well, you take what works for you, right? <laughs> what you can put in your toolbox is understanding that God needs you. The same way I'm saying God's my support, which he is. He's my strength, which he is. God also needs me. 
God's constantly watching us. God needs us. God depends on our service. And that thought also shifts my day because it creates almost like a, a drive, an accountability. I'm here to do something. I'm not just, you know, passively letting life happen. No, God's relying on me. This is, again, one of the most fundamental ideas, one of the most foundational ideas to have as we start our day, to give purpose to our day, to give drive and meaning to our day is God needs me. God's relying on me. God's waiting for me. And all of which is true. <laughs> You're not just telling this to yourself. It's actually the truth. And when you have these thoughts, that creates a successful day because it creates a day where you know this day has to have purpose. This day has to have meaning. God's waiting for me. I can't let him down. So that's also a very, very foundational idea to really, really empower our whole day. Understanding that God's the creator. Everything that happens is part of his world, like Father was saying. It's all part of his world. Understanding our obligation to pass on things to our children and grandchildren. You are so blessed. You know far more than most people in this world about God. And maybe your children don't know as much. And maybe your grandchildren don't have the same wealth. Knowing, having this injunction of passing this on, of giving it to them when you live that way, that creates a good day. And sort of going back to what Rachel said, really trying to love the people around you and to understand that everyone's equally worthy of our love. That changes our day. Another foundational idea of Torah that really, really impacts the day when we take this to heart is we need to work hard. A successful day is a day, yeah, when I work hard. Everything real comes with hard work. Now, you come from a different place, but you lived in America long enough to absorb Americana, American mentality, Western world mentality, and especially American mentality. So what I just said is the antithesis of American mentality, but not really, not really. The American dream is somehow always someone that, you know, started off poor and pulled himself up by his bootstraps which means with a lot of hard work in this golden land of opportunity with a lot of hard work created a lot of success. And that's true with godliness. That's true actually, not just with godliness, that's true with everything in life. Anything real requires a lot of work. When I have that perspective on life, I'm setting myself up for a great day. When I have the perspective that I'm going to work hard, and that's good. That's fine. That's wonderful. That's healthy. There's nothing wrong with working hard. It's good to work hard. It means, well, I'm going to achieve something really worthwhile. So that mentality is really, really beneficial to create that really good day. And on a much more spiritual note, on a more spiritual note to know, I'm here to make this world God's home. I'm here to make this world a place where he's comfortable being. I'm here to bring redemption. Again, when I start off my day with any of these thoughts, and I just gave you many, it's a different day. It's a day that has power. It's a day that has meaning. It's a day that has drive. It's a day that has a purpose. When I'm looking at my day and there's a purpose, what I'm supposed to accomplish, the whole day feels different. And when we think about that, and we know we're working hard, and we think, that maybe God's happy with us. Sometimes we do something and we feel that, you know, you made God happy. That's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day because what could give us more joy than knowing we're giving God? So as Rachel said, I am balancing the idea of love everyone. That creates a great day. See the good in everyone. That creates a great day. And at the same time, have those fortresses. 
put up those protective barriers. Don't let pollutants harm you. Similar to that is you're going to have a good day. That means you're going to do something. That means you're going to accomplish something. That means you're going to achieve something, which probably means you're going to have some opposition. Again, it's just the reality. When someone's achieving and accomplishing, there's going to be some opposition. Don't let it phase you. Don't let it pull you down. Accept it as part of what we're supposed to deal with to grow in this world. Again, accept it could be ignore it, but don't get upset by it. Don't be surprised by it. Don't be surprised when you're doing something good and there's opposition. Who would oppose to good? You'd be surprised. Don't be surprised. View this as a different opportunity to grow, to grow by not getting pulled down. And maybe you could remember other times you had opposition and how in the end it worked out. And this too will work out. It's actually, it's discussed the concept of someone who's trying to pray and someone's coming and distracting him. Oh, why is God having, you're trying to pray. You're actually trying to do what God wants. And then someone's trying to distract you. I mean, come on, like this is when you ever try to really pray and someone comes and distracts you. So no, this is all part of God's plot. This is the opposition, right? You're trying to pray and there's opposition. Someone's coming and distracting you and trying to get you to stop praying. Why does God send me opposition? Because this opposition is forcing me to pray better. Because I have to so concentrate on my prayers, I'm not going to hear this guy and all of his rant that's trying to distract me. So in the end, I'm going to concentrate more. I'm going to pray better than I would have prayed otherwise. So that's a very specific example you could say about prayer when you're trying to pray and someone's trying to distract you and therefore you concentrate more and therefore in the end you pray even better than without. No, that actually applies to everything in our life. That applies to all opposition. In every opposition, it's that same pattern, just with different window dressing. What's this opposition coming to deepen with me? What's this opposition coming to teach me? Maybe my response to it shows where I'm really at. But every time there's opposition, it's part of God's program. Again, as we said, one of our preliminary ideas for this great day, God's world. He's running it. It's all him. Everything is deliberate. Everything is designed. And yes, you're trying good and hard. And that's where there's opposition to go even deeper to succeed even more. Any other tips people have how they handle opposition? Because of course, we all know about opposition. I um, heard, I was at a lecture <clears throat> and the rabbi was talking about like he mentally um, talked to, to his it's a horror. He uh, confronted his it's a horror. And I tried to do it uh, once too, and 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 um, it, it worked for me. I I I'm not very good at prayer. It's it's hard for me to pray. And doing the prayer there, it was that one paragraph that was small letters and monotonous. And every time I started, I'm like, oh, maybe I can skip it. Is it really that important? That thought kept coming to me. So at this point, I, I kind of can't, uh, I spoke uh, directly to it's a horror. I said, I'm not going to let you do it. I said, I'm going to say this with um, more concentration. I'm going to listen to each word. I'm going to concentrate. I got up and I said this paragraph and maybe for the first time I felt it. And it felt good, like I stood up to my it's a horror. And you know, since then, I never hear that thought when I read this paragraph. Yeah, it's a horror, so it's not worth it. <laughs> I'm not starting up with Rivka, not going there. I'm going to be the loser. No way. I agree. Sometimes I laugh at my evil inclination, my it's a horror. I say, what? You think at my age, I'm going to fall for this again? I know you've messed me up with this many times, but by now, you think I'm still falling for this stupid trick of yours? Of course, I do sometimes. 
But sometimes you, when you can identify and say, you, this, this evil, I'm going to fall for this evil. I think that's a similar technique and it definitely works for me as well. Anyone else, how they stand up for opposition? I didn't actually wasn't even referring to the inner opposition. But what Rivka said, of course, is 100% true. And that's definitely a force of opposition we deal with. Another important tool that really helps create that great day, because that great day is coming from another great day, coming from another great day. It's a whole progression in our life. And something that really helps us be those type of movers and doers and achievers, all of which gives you such a sense of positivity and success in your life, is really reflecting what I did right today, what I should have done differently, what I need to change. And everybody needs some format to evaluate themselves, to calculate, to reflect, to help us grow and not get stuck. Getting stuck means keeping doing the same mistakes again and again and again. Like it didn't work the first time. It's probably not going to work the next time either, no matter how many times you keep doing it. Sometimes journaling helps with this nightly or at least once a week. An important point that Torah makes, which is good to reflect on, is people are never stationary. We never are in one place. We are always moving. We will always, any second of our life, be going up or be going down. Angels are created on a certain level and they're like that forever. And we are always in a state of flux. So that's the reality of our existence. So if that's the reality of my existence, I'd like to make sure, as much as I can make sure, that I'm going up. Because if I'm not going up, what's an absolute truth is I'm going down. No, I'm just treading water. I'm staying still. No, there's actually no such thing. It's impossible. That's not what we're like. We're not stationary. We don't just stand still and we don't go up, but we don't go down. It doesn't work. We're always up or down or up or down or up or down or up or down. Our entire existence. So as such, if you understand that, if you have something and everybody can have different ideas, practically it could be different for every single person, but something that helps you mark your growth, see where you're moving up, see where you're slacking off, see what you need to work on, understand if you've gotten out of this Egypt or not, and what's the next Egypt to get out of, and the next. See if your day has that drive and that purpose and that meaning and that achievement. And if not, why not? And what to do about it and how to create it. All of this gives you, gives you a day, gives you a life that's full of, again, movement, purpose, success. And I'm just going to end on this idea. It's good to say songs along the way. The Hillen Psalms really help. And it's something you should do every day to bring down that success, to make this day a great day. Say Psalm 20, say 23, say 122. Say it daily. Find a time. We can't even fathom how much power is brought down by Psalms. There's nothing that brings down more of God's kindness and compassion to us than Psalms and Tehillim. So you want that great day? We all want that great day. You want to make it beyond? Bring God in. There's many ways to bring God in. And I'm, of course, I'd love you to do all of them. But Psalms, the Hillam really helps bringing down the compassion for another day that worked. Another day that was good. Another day that you achieved. Another day that felt meaningful another great day. All right, we're not done, but we will stop here. Thank you so much for joining. It was such a nachas note that Rachel remembered what we discussed last week. So please keep it in mind. 
the idea is not to say, oh, that was a nice class. No. The idea is to put it in your toolbox, apply it. We gave so many things. Oh my gosh, you don't even know which to apply first. So many things to apply, so many ideas to use. Try it, use it, use one, use 10. And hopefully you should see it works. It works because it does.